This conference will now be recorded. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Jennifer Buhite. I'm the education coordinator at Old Woman Creek, which is a state nature preserve and a national estuarine research reserve. Uh, this brown bag is the second to last brown bag of the year. Um, we, we didn't get to quite do them all, but we've had a couple virtually. Um, and we will have one more virtually in October, on October 9th. Um, our manager, Janice Kearns, will be talking about wetland, wetland health in the state of wetlands in Ohio. So um, just like we did for this one, I will send out an announcement and um, you can um, log on um, for that one. But today we are talking um, about our phenological species monitoring program. We had uh, one intern this summer, which is smaller than we normally have. Uh, and we only got to meet her virtually, um, but she's done an awesome work, uh, awesome amount of work um, with Emily, who you can see up in the corner, who's our coastal training and program coordinator um, and her species monitoring um, is, is helmed by her and um, Cameron Arnstein joined us from the University of South Carolina through the Holland Scholar Program uh, through NOAA um, and she saw our, our species monitoring program and thought um, it looked interesting and that she could provide us with some help. Um, she's in the marine science and the environmental studies programs uh, at uh, University of South Carolina and I'm going to let her um, say hello and then tell us all the fun things um, and the the immense uh, expansion of our program that she did. Cameron? All right, so hello everybody. My name is Cameron Arnstein again, and I'm a senior at the University of South Carolina, where I'm pursuing a dual degree in marine science and environmental studies. And the NOAA goal my internship primarily focused on was climate adaptation and mitigation. And I interned at the Old Woman Creek National Estuarine Research Reserve. And my mentors were Pete Wiley and Emily Kuzmik. And I will be talking at today's virtual brown bag and giving an update on the phenological species monitoring program. And so in this presentation, I'll be going over just some background on my internship. I will give an update on the program. And then I'll specifically talk about my Hollands project and I'll run through the objectives, the methodology, I also included a tutorial of the trail cam software that I ended up using, um, which is Deer Lab, and you guys will be able to see our account and what we've been doing on it. And then I'll also include the results and the summary of my project, and I'll end on my acknowledgements. And so just some background on my internship. Um, so it was this summer with the Hollings program, and um, that's housed within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, otherwise known as NOAA. And within NOAA, it's with the National Ocean Service. And then with the National Ocean Service, it's in the National Estuary and Research Reserve System. And the reserve I worked at, well, I interned at was Old Woman Creek National Estuary and Research Reserve, which is a state and federal partnership with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Office of Coastal Management. And just some quick information about Old Woman Creek. It is one of 29 uh, reserves in the system. And even more so, it's one of two great lakes in the system. Uh, within the system, it's the smallest reserve with just over 573 acres. And it was actually the first freshwater estuary in the system. And it's located in here in Ohio. And I actually uh, pinpointed it on the map for quick reference. And as you can see, looking at the map, it's located on the southwestern shore of Lake Erie and it's comprised of protected land, an estuary and ecosystem, and a barrier beach. And so I was the 2020 Old Woman Creek Phenological Species Monitoring Intern, and so that deals with uh, phenology, and some of you may have not have heard of phenology or still may be unclear of it, but I included a definition of it. Phenology is the study of cyclic and seasonal natural phenomena, especially in relation to plant and animal life. And so that's basically using climate data and comparing it to the presence and activity of plants and animals. And so in 2016, the Old Woman Creek Reserve actually established its own phenological species monitoring program. And our monitoring program at the reserve focuses on monitoring the wildlife species. And the wildlife species that are picked for our program are keystone or indicator species. And so keystone species play a key role in the Old Woman Creek environment 
and they are fundamentally critical to the functioning of the ecosystem. An example of this is the bald eagle, which is an apex predator. And then indicator species are species that indicate crucial environmental conditions. And so an example of this is the lungless salamanders at the uh, reserve, and they do not have any lungs, so they rely on um, oxygen exchange. And so because of this, they're really sensitive to the environment around them, um, such as soil, temperature, the moisture, or acidity. And so if they, um, if we notice that we aren't seeing as many lungless salamanders and their presence and activity has just really decreased, that could be an indicator that there's something um, that might be an issue with the environment at the moment. And most likely if it's affecting these indicator species, such as the lungless salamanders, and it is most likely going to affect all the species in the reserve. So we can really use them to indicate what's going on in the environment. And so within our program, we have nine species initiatives, and that includes avian monitoring, nest box monitoring, bald eagle nesting activity, longland salamander monitoring, vernal pool monitoring, frog and toad monitoring, marsh bird monitoring, beaver activity, and muskrat monitoring. And what's really awesome about our phenological monitoring program is we actually utilize citizen science, and citizen science is an awesome way to do science. Um, and one, because citizen scientists allow for more data to be collected really efficiently as well as inexpensively. And then second, um, citizen science helps um, with the public outreach um, for our program and on um, the reserve in general. And what's really cool is a lot of citizen scientists also have their very own like expertise on any of the species that we just mentioned. And so they have a lot of knowledge about um, the species prior to even being a citizen science monitor. And so we definitely love utilizing any expertise they have. And again, we love seeing um, community members that are invested in the health of the environment around them and just want to help us out with this program. And so my efforts this summer were virtual. And so as a virtual intern, I focused on entering the data and managing the data electronically. And I wanted to take a moment to thank all the citizen scientists that have been collecting all the data. Um, you guys gave me something to do this summer. Um, and I really enjoy entering all your data. Um, because I wasn't able to get out there and collect it myself, but I was glad that somebody was. And so I made sure that all the data for 2020 that we received so far has been entered into all the spreadsheets. And so I was also really lucky because the last hauling scholar that interned at the reserve actually created master spreadsheets for a bunch of the species in our program. And so I was able to utilize her master spreadsheets and just continue entering the data based off of. Um, all the data validation and management she already created. So um, I was really fortunate that they were, that was already created for the program. And I definitely continued entering data in the same manner that had been um, entered previous. And so the species I really focused on this summer were the avian lungless salamander, frogs and toads, marsh birds, beavers, and muskrats, and another um, effort that I made for the program was I wrote data entry protocols for these species because I really worked with them and I was entering a bunch of their data. So I wanted to make sure when I ended my internship and moved on that the next intern could just pick up where I left off and enter data in the same way I was to continue a consistent and accurate method of entering data. And so I made sure those protocols um, really walked through each step I would do with the columns for the data in the master spreadsheet, and it can be used as a resource. Um, they don't necessarily have to read all of it, but if they have a question about well, where do I get this value for the um, humidity or the pressure, they know how I was able to find that value and enter it and continue entering it in the same way I did um, to keep up with that consistent way of entering data. And so I also just wanted to highlight the avian initiative because I did work a lot with this one. And so in our program, we have a protocol for avian monitoring. And so we have four point counts. Um, and what we do at point counts is you'll stand um, in a specific location for a specific amount of time and observe anything you hear or see. And so for our reserve, we have four different point counts. And these are on our four different trails. Um, 
the green trail um, is the lowland forest, the purple trail is the prairie of uh, habitat, the red trail is the upland forest, and the blue trail is the estuary overlook. And so you can go on to any of these four point counts and use our citizen science data sheet for the avian protocol. And what's really cool is we're monitoring at different habitats. So it's interesting to see if we have any similarities or differences in some of the birds we're seeing or hearing. And what's also um, what's included also is um, the citizen scientists will usually uh, have a time of about 15 minutes. Um, usually they can go over if they want, but it doesn't have to. And then they will also uh, record any data like environmentally, um, the weather, um, pressure, humidity, and then they can also include the equipment they used as well as um, any noises they hear because that could maybe affect the birds we're seeing in that area. And so at the bottom, as you can see, we have the 15 most abundant species by trail. And this is actually um, created using our data that we have so far from the monitoring program. And um, this is just one way we are able to use our data. Um, there's uh, way more ways we can analyze it and really get some interesting results. But I think uh, this 15 most abundant species by trail is also a good tool to um, help with our monitoring program because we can give it to beginner uh, monitors who may be unfamiliar with the common birds in the area, but they can go to the blue trail and maybe look for these 15 most abundant. And this will also help us have um, more consistent and accurate data collection. Um, but yeah, so that's the avian. And then the next one I wanted to highlight was the muskrats. As you guys can see from this picture, um, this is a muskrat. They are a semi-aquatic rodent-like animal with a round tail. And in our estuary, they create lodges and feeding platforms. And we also have a muskrat monitoring protocol. And so our citizen science monitors will go out on a paddle route. And when they see a muskrat lodge or feeding platform, they will paddle over to it and start collecting the data. And that includes the time of their observation, any environmental parameters such as um, the temperature, um, the cloud coverage. Uh, they also look for vegetation cover and take the coordinates as well. And then they'll begin uh, measuring for the lodge dimensions. And we also included a flag ID system to help um, account for or better account for the lodges we have been recording. And that also helps us tell in a better way whether the lodge is changing from active to inactive or maybe changing from a lodge to a feeding platform and vice versa. And that's all in our protocol and our citizen scientists follow it. And then at the, to the right is actually a data visualization using our data we have on the muskrats. And so this is lodges by year. And as you guys can see, the different colors correspond to um, different years. And so this is just one way we are visualizing our data. And from this specific, uh, specific one, we can see the distribution of lodges in the reserve. And I think that's just something that we should definitely keep in mind. And as um, the years go on, we will want to um, see this change or see the similarity in the distribution of lodges. And so with all of the initiatives, including the muskrat and the avian, I really worked on entering the 2020 data to um, you know, keep up with all the data collection and data management so that when, we, when the time comes to really analyze this long-term monitoring program, we have um, all the years accounted for and um, we weren't like caught up in all the data that we still need to enter. So I really worked on getting all the data up to speed in the master spreadsheets that Osana, um, the last previous intern, created. And so now I wanted to transition into my specific Hollings project. So as a NOAA Hollings scholar, um, the scholars have to pick a project to really focus in on during our 10-week internship. And I was really given a lot of freedom with the project I could pick, and I ended up picking the um, investigating camera trap analysis methods to assess ecological influence at an active beaver lodge in the Great Lakes region. And so my project, I really wanted to implement a trail cam software to organize and analyze 
the robust beaver trail cam data. And um, when I began my project, I predicted that implementing trail cam software would reduce the time and labor spent on lodge footage. Um, it's really fun to work with trail cams and get all the footage and see um, everything that's being captured and everything, but it is very time consuming and takes a lot of energy to really go through um, sometimes months of footage. So I wanted to implement this software to hopefully alleviate all that time and labor that needs to be expended on lodge footage. And secondly, I wanted to effectively organize the extensive amount of photos. Um, like I mentioned, it's really awesome that we have all these photos um, that have been taken from 2016, um, beginning in 2016. And that means, you know, we're capturing a lot of presence and activity of the species at our particular lodge, but from a data management perspective, it can kind of be a headache if it's not organized well. And so I wanted just to make sure that the software we chose would really help with this organization. And lastly, I wanted to better sustain the efforts of past and future work of the Old Woman Creek staff and the future interns who would work on the Beaver Initiative. And so we have a high seasonal intern turnover rate. And so with that, it kind of can um, make the seamlessness of going from intern to intern not as smooth. So I, I think this software would really help um, make this transition from intern to intern um, uh, more smooth and it would also keep up with the consistent um, way, like the, the consistent protocol we work with as well as the data extraction that we end up doing with the photos. And so just make a very sustainable protocol and procedure um, moving forward. And so my project focused on beavers, so I thought it'd be a good idea just to include some really quick facts about beavers in case um, you guys aren't too familiar with them. I know when I started my project, I, I knew not as much as I thought I did, um, but through my project, I was able to research um, beavers and I really, uh, actually, I really admire them now. I think I was severely underrating them as a species and I now understand their importance. And that is because they are a keystone species in the uh, ecosystems they're in. And so again, that's why they are one of the species that we monitor in our monitoring program. And so they're actually second to humans in terrestrial engineering. And that means they can create extensive lodges with just massive dimensions. Um, it's really interesting to see. A lot of times you can see them. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry about that. Uh, let me see if I can get back to it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but a lot of times you can see lodges from the top of the water, but actually beaver lodges will go underneath the water and they'll actually create really um, intricate channels. And, and it's really cool to see um, a lot of documentaries feature this, but they can also dam tributaries by felling hundreds of trees. And felling trees is actually really intense because the trees are pretty large and beavers will spend a lot of time chewing and gnawing through the trees. And what's really cool is they also um, have been seen to really use wind to help topple the tree over. So it's also really interesting to um, know that beavers are so in tune with their environment that they can utilize it to kind of expend less energy and time when they are creating their lodges. Um, so yeah, so the beavers can quickly modify environments in short periods of time. And this is by altering water dynamics and vegetation composition. And um, I was reading a study that said that beaver, beavers actually, the way they make their lodges and, every, and everything really um, helps bodies of water be more deep. And so that actually decreases the amount of evaporation that happens in that particular area. So when it comes to droughts, beavers actually um, mitigate the effects of droughts uh, a lot better than bodies of water that don't have beavers. And another really interesting an important factor about beavers is that they create habitat for other species and beaver lodges have been termed to be uh, biodiversity hotspots, which means they increase biodiversity in the ecosystem. And this is really essential to the functioning um, ecologically of an environment. All right, and so just some background about beavers at Old Woman Creek and within our monitoring program. In 2015, beavers were recorded for the first time at the reserve in years. And since then, we've had one beaver family and an active lodge in the estuary. 
And in our monitoring program, we have year-round monitoring with motion capture trail cameras at the active lodge. And we utilize three different camera traps and that we are monitoring for presence and activity of beavers as well as secondary species at these camera traps. And the secondary species, um, their concentration depends on the primary species. And in this case, that's the beavers. And so the secondary species we have actually picked up on the cameras is really diverse and the list is pretty long. Um, and that includes raccoons, muskrats, Canada goose, um, foxes, great blue herons, uh, turkeys, white-tailed deer, green herons, and the list honestly goes on and on. It's really cool that we're picking that up on the trail cameras. And so our intent is to use the trail cam photos and the data we can get from that, um, which is the beaver activity as well as the secondary species activity. And then we're gonna use it with other data collected to assess how beavers are responding to a changing environment. And the other data we utilize is um, the system-wide monitoring program. And we actually utilize two different stations, one for meteorological parameters, such as um, the temperature, as well as the precipitation, pressure, humidity, and then the water quality parameters, such as uh, water temperature, estuary depth, and dissolved oxygen. And so we utilize all the data we can get and extract from the photos. And then we also um, add the other data from the swamp system-wide monitoring program data. And we are going to analyze if the beavers are responding seasonally to their changing environment throughout the year, as well as over time when we're looking at a broader scale of a range of years. And this is really looking at climate change impacts and seeing if beavers are impacted and if the lodge is also impacted. And so this slide just gives you guys an overview of the different perspectives we have at the lodge. We have the west perspective, the east perspective, and the south perspective. And so we have three camera traps, but then we use two different um, camera makes and models. And so at the west and the south, we use uh, the Cabela's camera as our trail camera. And then at the east perspective, we use the Recon X camera. And so this slide I just included just to show you some of the beavers that we have actually picked up on the trail cameras. Um, and so in the top left, as you guys can see, we are seeing beavers in all types of harsh conditions. They are still active and present in the environment. And then um, in the photo in the middle, this is just um, us picking up some beaver activity, whether that be um, this beaver is just swimming or maybe going to look for some lodge building materials or maybe going to look for some food. Um, yeah, so we're just picking up the beaver activity um, on this trail camera. And then uh, the two pictures that uh, showcase the beaver family. This is really important that we are capturing this because the beaver family does fluctuate over the years. And in a beaver family, you can have kids, yearlings, and adults. And as time progresses, the kids can become yearlings and, and the yearlings can become adults. So as you can see, um, the beaver family numbers can uh, fluctuate. And so it's really good that these trail cameras are picking up the beaver so we can keep um, better tabs on what exactly is composing of the beaver family in our specific lodge and estuary. And then this slide just shows you guys some of the secondary species that we also are picking up on the cameras. As you can see, we have a white-tailed deer, a coyote, and then a green heron with a cormorant in its mouth, as well as some ducks. And again, all these species are um, active and present um, in different uh, weather conditions and environmental seasons. And I really like that the trail cameras pick up all these secondary species because it's helped proving the fact that beaver lodges are really biodiversity hotspots and they attract a wide range of species. And um, I think like it really shows the food web in this particular environment pretty well and how um, complex it actually is. And a lot of times these trail camera photos are picking up stuff that we otherwise would not know is really going on at the lodge. So definitely important that we're picking up the beaver activity as well as the secondary species because it gives us a more um, holistic understanding of our environment. And so um, my first step was selecting a trail cam software and I had to really think about all the data we had and how to best 
um, implement a software that would really make the most of all the data we have. And so my project focused on implementing a trail cam software that would reduce the time and energy spent processing and analyzing the footage. And then I wanted to make sure the software would also organize the photos because this would really help us with our data extraction and that would make it more efficient, accurate, and more objective. And so when I was selecting a trail cam software, I began by researching all the software available and there are tons of different softwares out there um, and they all have different features. So I really had to compare the features and then um, ultimately pick the software that was the most suitable option for our program. And I made sure to discuss with my Old Woman Creek Direct Supervisor, Emily, just to ensure that the appropriate software was chosen. And the software uh, we ended up selecting was Deer Lab. And I'm going to get into why we ended up choosing this one because of its features and the potential we saw in it. And so I first began by implementing Deer Lab into our program. And so that really was entering the coordinates for each camera trap. And as you guys can see, the pictures on the left are actually photos I um, screenshotted from the Deer Lab website. And this shows you an aerial uh, photo of the cameras in the estuary as well as the surrounding environment. And as you guys can see, um, there's agricultural land around it as well as a railroad. So this is really important for us to remember and consider um, whether these factors of the surrounding environment are impacting the beavers and the beaver lodge. So that is just um, a good way to visualize it. And then um, I began uploading the trail cam photos to Deer Lab. And this was um, really interesting because you know, you're not too sure how long softwares will process your photos, but Deer Lab really processes all the photos in like a matter of seconds. So again, just the efficiency with Deer Lab is really good. And then I began utilizing the Deer Lab software features. And one of the features is actually the weather conditions for each photo. So once you upload a photo to Deer Lab, Deer Lab uses the timestamp with the date and the time, and it pulls um, the weather conditions for that photo using its own weather stations that are nearby here in Ohio. And so with each photo, we have these weather conditions, and that really increases our data on um, all, the, all the trail cam data. It gives us that second layer of Deer Lab also giving data for us. Um, and we really utilize this when we're looking at trends. And when I get into the Deer Lab profiles in a second, uh, we can pick up if there's um, something really significant that we should go back and utilize our own reserves data and then make um, a more valid conclusion. But it's really nice that Deer Lab already kind of does this for us. And then it really makes our data analyzation as well as extraction um, a little more honed in if we are looking for something in particular. And so the next couple of features I'm going to go into are um, auto tagging by Deer Lab. So there are um, an uh, there is an auto tagging feature on Deer Lab. And with we've noticed with the beavers, it's not as successful just because beavers are um, submerged half the time. Um, but that's not to say it's not useful. There are other species that Deer Lab has been picking up and auto tagging for us, including this Canada goose. It was auto tagged as a bird. And so I went in and I tagged it further with the Canada goose after I saw it was tagged with the bird. Um, and you can actually um, modify the criteria for your auto tagging. Um, if you're confident in the way Deer Lab is auto tagging your species, you can actually um, keep it at a certain level of uh, auto tagging confidence factor, um, but if you're not, you can then, um, you know, put it to a number you are, um, you feel more comfortable with for your specific auto tagging needs. And then you can create your own tags for photos. And this is definitely something I've been utilizing um, when I was working with um, the trail cam photos. When I uploaded them to Deer Lab, I would go through, and if I saw a beaver, I would tag it with the beaver tag. If I saw it on um, multiple beavers, I would tag it with the multiple beavers tag. And then if I saw secondary species, I would tag it with a secondary species tag. And then I'd further tag that secondary species depending on what it was. And this really goes hand in hand with the next feature, which is quickly filtering photos. Um, you can filter your photos by the date, time, camera, tags, weather conditions, and more. And this is where if I wanted to look up all the uh, photos that have the beaver tag, I can simply put it in this filter, which is um, showcased at the top of this slide. 
and it will bring up any of the photos that have beavers in them all the way back to 2016 that I have uploaded and tagged with that beaver tag. So that's de definitely like time saving and really narrows in on what we're looking for if we wanted to make that analysis of beavers. Um, you can also have multiple filter criteria. So if I wanted beavers and then if I wanted it within a specific temperature range, I can also put that into the filter and it would give me all the photos that are beavers and within that specific temperature range. And again, I can do that with secondary species. I can, if I wanted to see all the squirrels, I could do that with the squirrels. Um, but yeah, definitely useful feature. And the last two features I wanted to mention was Deer Lab actually creates specific profiles based on your tags. And then these tags will actually um, have quick stats that are created and produced by Deer Lab. And so I have two profiles on our account right now, which is the beavers and the secondary species profile. And as you guys can see at the bottom, um, we have some graphs and these are from Deer Lab based off the beaver profile. So again, this is just really quick data visualization of what we're seeing um, from our trail cam photos. And this is, um, Deer Lab has done all this work for us, which is really nice. And if we see something that we think is really interesting and we should look into more, we can then go back and utilize our um, beaver data and our reserve data and make our own conclusions. But it's nice that Deer Lab is already kind of one step ahead of this and giving us that initial feedback from our trail cam photos. And then the last feature is you can create album links for your photos based on selected tags. And so um, I have a beaver album and a secondary species album currently on our account. And if I give that link to anybody I want, they can access the photos that I've uploaded and tagged with the beaver tag. And I think this is a really good feature if we're looking to um, promote more public outreach with the beaver initiative because um, the public can then keep up with what's being seen at the lodge. And I think it's really fun to just go through and see um, all of the photos that are in the album. You can go back to all the way to 2016 and work your way up to 2020 if you wanted. And yeah, and so I definitely think that's a really useful feature. Okay, and so now I'm on the Deer Lot tutorial. So I'm just gonna quickly run through the software and its features. So I will bring up the account. Okay. Um, let me know if you guys can't see this, but I'm on the Deer Lab account right now. And so when you log into the account, it brings you to your properties. And um, this is our property, Old Woman Creek Beaver and Secondary Species Monitoring at an active beaver lodge. And so um, when I click this first tab right here, it's the cameras. And this is where I got that aerial photo. You can actually zoom out if you want to get a better understanding of the environment around it or around our lodge and the cameras. And then you can add some labels if you want it to orient yourself a little bit better with what's around um, the reserved and the lodge. And then you can also switch to this map mode and you can add terrain if you wanted to. If you were looking into that, you could. Um, yeah, I think this is definitely a useful uh, visualization of where the beaver lodge is and you can zoom in um, as much as you want as well. And then here at the bottom, this is where all of our cameras are and the perspective, uh, and they're separated by perspectives. And then we have the different makes and models for each one that corresponds to the perspective. It also shows you all of the photo uploads we have currently. And this is also where you can upload as well as um, edit your photos and you can add another camera here if you want to as well. And so the next tab, I, and this is where I spend most of my time is the photos. Um, so yeah, so when you click on the photos, you're brought to this page. And if I scroll down, um, there's about, I think like 84 pages per, or no, 84 photos per page. And yeah, so as you guys can see, I've gone through and I tagged them all. Um, depending on what I see in the photo. And if you click on a photo, it, it's brought to a, a larger image of it. And you can um, just click through what we're seeing. Um, if you wanted to view the weather for the, the specific photo, you can do that as well. And it'll bring you to that weather conditions for that the specific photo. Um, you can also go back to the photos. And um, as you guys can see, this is also November, 2016. If we go, to the last page, it's already organized by December 2019. And this organization is already 
um, included when you upload to Deer Lab. It automatically organizes. So that's really nice for us because um, we don't have to really worry about it if Deer Lab already does it for us. And then um, you can also let me refresh really quickly. You can also sort your photos if you wanted to see um, from new to old. You can do that in a, a click of a button. And it brings you to March 2020. You can also do it by upload date. If you just uploaded very recently and you wanted to tag these specific photos, you can do that as well. Um, but yeah, so that's really nice. And then I wanted to go into the tagging photos feature. This is where you can tag your photos. And if you click onto here, you can click a specific um, tag. And then you can go down here and click as many photos applies to that tag. You can zoom in more and also click tag here if you see something and it deserves a tag, you can then tag that way. And then you would just click add tags. But if you also wanted to remove tags, you can also mass remove tags this way as well. And then deleting photos is the same way. You can just um, delete a mass amount of photos if you needed to. Um, say you uploaded some photos and they were mishits where there actually wasn't anything captured um, species wise, it may be have just been like a move of um, grass or like the trees or something near it, but actually no species. Um, don't worry, it's not like permanently on Deer Lab. You can just delete them and go through and just make sure all the photos um, that you have on Deer Lab you actually want on Deer Lab because you want to analyze them later. And then the next uh, feature is the filter feature. And this is really, um, really important um, for our program because you can filter by date and time on um, the camera, as well as the tags, the weather conditions I mentioned earlier. So if I wanted to find um, all of the, let me see, uh, all of so this one, the beavers, I can then go through and this shows me all the photos we have tagged with beavers. And as of right now, that's um, almost 2000 photos, but we definitely have more. I wasn't able to get to all the photos um, that we have taken, but this is what we have as of right now, uploaded to Deer Lab, and it's still a, a lot of photos. Um, so yeah, so it just shows you all of the photos that have this tag of beaver. If I wanted to um, have a specific um, temperature range, I could also include that and apply this filter. And now it's um, way less uh, photos that came up, which is just 37. Um, so if you wanted to get really specific with the temperature and the species, you definitely have that option. And as you guys saw, it only took a matter of like a second. Um, and that, yeah, if I wanted to look at the secondary species, I can also do that and apply that filter. And it brings up all of the photos that I have tagged with the secondary species tag. So definitely very useful, especially as the monitoring program continues, we're only going to um, have more photos. So definitely having this little search engine really um, helps us um, with our data management. And so the next feature I wanted to run through was the profiles. And this is where I mentioned the statistics that Deer Lab produces for us. If I click onto the beavers profile, it gives me this little summary report of what we're seeing um, commonly with our beaver sightings. And then if you click onto the next tab, which is time, it actually produces this uh, graph of um, all the timing of the sightings we're seeing with the beavers. And as you guys can see, we have a lot of nocturnal spotting, and that makes sense because beavers um, are primarily nocturnal, so that really is being reflected in our data. And then you can also click on to cams, and this shows the camera that has been picking up the most um, sightings, as well as also, you can also see it, which camera is picking up the least, but I think we could also use this if we see that the east perspective as way more sightings, we might want to consider putting more cameras in this location just to increase the sightings we are seeing. Um, and so yeah, and so then there's also wind, which is really neat if we wanted to maybe look more into if wind is affecting beavers' presence and activity. Um, we can also look at moon phases. Um, and this is really interesting. There is a study um, on beaver activity in the different moon phases. So I think if our program wanted to do our own research on the beavers that we have in our reserve, we definitely could. And Deer Lab will help us with that, just quickly seeing what 
uh, moon phases are um, corresponding to the most sightings. And then temperature as a phenological monitoring program, we are really interested in climate data. So this one is definitely important. Um, and as we get more photos in the years progress, it'll be interesting to see how um, our data is um, distributed. So yeah, and then the heat map is just really a visualization of the activity at each camera. Um, as you guys can see, this is the east one and it has the most activity as of right now. So that's just a good um, visualization of camera activity. And then again, this is where our photos are at um, for all the beaver tags. And the last one is the album link that I just wanted to go through really fast. If you click on the beaver album, and if I give this link to anybody, um, I have a short description um, highlighting what is on this album and you can click through and see um, all the beaver that we have tagged. Um, so yeah, I think this album will definitely help with public outreach and you can also share it um, through Facebook and Twitter. Um, so, and there's also the secondary species one, which is really fun to go through and see what we have spotted. Um, yeah, so that really um, is the deer lot tutorial I wanted to show you guys. And now I'll go back to my uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my project results really um, was a success with Deer Lab, and this is because this software is such a powerful tool and it really enhances um, the Beaver Initiative and our monitoring program. And this is seen as it stores and effectively organizes all of our trail cam data. And Deer Lab helps with photo analysis and data extraction, making it way more efficient and accurate. And it really enhances the Beaver protocol um, even more so. And it further assists in analyzing how the beavers are responding and adapting to climate change. And um, this also can apply to the secondary species. We are picking up on the cameras, whether they're responding and adapting to climate change. Um, with them being spotted at the lodge, we can also make some findings about them as well. And so just in summary, I recognize the previously time consuming and labor intensive method that the our program had. And that's just because trail cam footage is a lot to take on and really go through, especially if you um, are getting a lot of movement and activity from your trail cams. And I wanted to then address this issue by implementing trail cam software to um, mitigate all the time and labor that you have to spend on your footage. And so this software that I ended up choosing was Deer Lab. And since it was such a success, I will be integrating it into the um, monitoring programs protocol. And so I refined the previous data management techniques. And then Deer Lab really facilitates the understanding of patterns and seasonal change at the lodge. And it lastly assists in overall monitoring of climate change impacts on the ecological functioning at our reserve. And um, using Deer Lab, we can really make informed recommendations and decisions on land management policies that have the potential to affect the wildlife species that are in our monitoring program. So I'm really grateful that this software um, helps us with making those informed recommendations and decisions. And so I lastly just wanted to acknowledge everybody that has been involved in my internship and overall experience. And that um, begins with Pete Wiley and Emily Kuznick, who were my Hollings mentors throughout the whole Hollings journey. Um, they were really supportive and great mentors. And Emily was my direct supervisor at Old Woman Creek, and she was so knowledgeable about the program. And she was always willing to answer all of my questions. And I definitely learned a lot from her. And I wanted to also thank the Oklahoma Creek Reserve staff because you guys are always helpful and very friendly and I interacted with you guys. And then I also wanted to thank the citizen scientists at the reserve. Um, you guys really make the monitoring program what it is and it wouldn't be where it is and how successful um, without you guys. And it's really inspiring um, to me. It makes me um, you know, think about my area and the citizen science programs that I should be getting involved with because citizen science is awesome. Definitely helps with um, promoting science in the community and getting everybody involved because it's really important. And I lastly want to thank the Noah Ernest F. Hollings Undergraduate Scholarship Program as my funding sponsor. 
And so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I have my contact info on this slide. If anybody wants to reach out about my internship or the Deer Lab Trail Cam software, feel free to. Um, I have listed my email, my phone number, and I'm now open to any questions that anybody may have. Thanks, Cameron. Wow, great work. That was a, a great presentation too. Um, so we do have some questions coming in the um, chat box here. So one um, is from um, Ken. He's on our advisory council. So, and he says, do other NARES, NAIR reserves have similar trail cam monitoring programs um, for cross NAIRS uh, reserve comparison? So have, have you or Emily come across anyone um, at another reserve doing this? Yeah, so I actually presented to, um, with the other NEARS hauling scholars and a lot of the other scholars also had um, beaver projects. And I learned from those presentations that other reserves are interested or already working with um, trail cams. And they were very interested in my project because I think um, they were running into the same kind of issue of finding the best software out there that would really um, just enhance the way they're going about trail cams. And so I spoke to the near stewardship um, coordinators, I think last week about it, and they were really interested in Deer Lab. Great. And then um, did I understand that we can then make those albums public, like the link and people can view them um, at their, you know, at their leisure, because we do have a lot of photos. Um, so Emily and I can work on that through Facebook and Twitter, um, through our, our friends' um, social media accounts. Um, so that's that's a great help because we get that question a lot, and we haven't had a method to conveniently do that for the public. Uh, any other questions? So if you want to ask a question in person, you can come off mute and, and do so. Um, if you come off mute, I'll call on you so we know one person's talking at a time. Any in-person questions? And it's, I mean, Cameron did a very thorough job. For the this article. Is, I have another question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Cameron, can you uh, just give us a list? Uh, off your off the top of your head uh, to some extent of the different uh, other animals that you saw I, you showed a fox for example what else did you see yeah um there's a lot of raccoons that were picked up on the trail plan as well as muskrats um canada canada goose um, mallard ducks minks oh, i'm trying to think um great blue herons turkeys uh, white-tailed deer. It was really interesting seeing the coyotes for me because I didn't know that that was in the area and there's actually um, some photos where there's two or three coyotes so it was really interesting to see because um, I was very interested in the beavers and just to know that like, um, that amount of predators are near their lodge is really um, interesting. <laughs> are the animals, are those attracted to the lodges? actually are they looking are they maybe smelling food or something from the beavers or are they trying to catch the beavers or do you know why they go there i i mean beaver lodges are really important because they change the environment so much and they make it um they can affect like the water um, dynamics and the vegetation around it so they could be utilizing the beaver lodge um you know, for water or the food, whether that be the beavers themselves, I, yeah, it depends on um, the animal, but it really just does attract so many different species. So, I mean, where there's um, more species as like a predator, you would want to go there. So, yeah, yeah, like for food, I would think, yes. Right. Um, yeah, the, the only one that really would hunt beaver, mink are known to hunt baby beavers. Um, so once they once a beaver gets full grown, pretty much only humans can um, can take it down. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a great question. Uh, Emily has a question. the The article about beaver activity in correlation with the moon phases did it mention whether um, the factor was the light availability or related to tides and or water levels? Yeah. So that uh, article I read was really interesting because it said 
that basically beavers actually prefer um, being active during the day, but since they were hunted to almost extinction by humans, they have switched over to nocturnal activity. And so with that research article, the scientists hypothesized that the beavers would be least active when there was a bunch of moonlight um, because they thought, you know, nocturnal, they would want it, you know, to be as dark, but they actually found that the beavers were the most active during the brightest moonlight nights. And that's because they do prefer daytime and so light. Um, so it'd be interesting to see as time progresses um, and since beavers aren't hunted as heavily as they were, if they will start being seen more often during the day instead of the nocturnal activity we are seeing as of right now. Okay, thank you. Tim, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, was there any big surprise? Did you see some of these was thought, well, I would have bet that would have never been here. Is there any <laughs> um, big surprise? Yeah, it's really um, funny. There were some people caught on the trail cameras that it's just funny to see because I feel like they were trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah, but um, I was always really um, surprised and I really love the pictures that have multiple species caught. There's a couple pictures where there's like a deer and a great blue heron and it's just, you know, it's just interesting to see both of them coexisting that close to each other. Um, and you know, I don't know if that would have, if I would have ever seen that without a trail cam photo being taken. For me, when we saw those river otters on the trail cam, um, we hadn't we hadn't documented river otter there in a long time. Um, so, you know, as Cameron said, it it becomes kind of the center of town um, for the estuary, and it really does attract a lot of them. And yes, lots of bald eagles too. And we've seen juveniles land there and all sorts of cool features. Sandy, do you have a question? I do. How many beaver are there now? Um, I'm not too certain. Of, Emily, do you have a good I idea? Think we definitely have a couple, like two, like two adults. And then I think we have three kids right now. And is okay, that so two adults limit, is pretty good. Yes, is that the limit for uh, the estuary, or will they build another beaver dam and populate the uh, area a little more? So they're pretty territorial, so usually it's just the one lodge. Um, and that's all we've seen so far on our property. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And they don't they don't seem to want to dam our water. We don't have that running water that makes that running water sound that beavers really dislike, which is why they tend to, to dam. So it's pretty clear that they're just there with a lodge, um, which is good for us. Um, although they have felled a few trees that uh, block our canoe, canoe trails sometimes. Um, any other questions? Um, all right, well, again, thank you, Cameron. Um, Thank you to our friends group who are awesome partners um, on this particular series and many others. Uh, and then uh, keep an eye out for a posting about our October 9th, uh, sorry, our October 9th talk where our manager Janice Kearns will be talking about wetlands, wetland health, and wetlands in Ohio. Rosie, did you have another question? Yeah, Sandy's going to serve us all cook coffee and cookies at her house. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> <I'm> over. <Yeah. laughs> Unfortunately, our, our coffee and dessert have gone away uh, during these virtual things, but hopefully you all were able to enjoy something um, while you watch this or you will um, soon hereafter. So thank you again, Cameron, and thank you for everyone for tuning in, uh, and we will see you next month. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Cameron.